last talk is entitled uh, Remote Sensing Archaeology at Serpent Mound, a review. Uh, this talk is kind of technical, uh, but it's a kind of a summary of some of the more modern archaeological uh, uh, examinations of Serpent Mound that have been done, many by myself and then others. I'm going to talk about and summarize a lot of that stuff. So uh, let's get going. So let's just uh, have a discussion here. What is remote sensing? Let me move this. Oh, video view. So remote sensing is the science and art of obtaining information about an area, an object, a phenomenon through the use of, or analysis of data gathered by devices that do not make physical contact with the object that you're studying. And so that usually in the scientific community that refers to airborne sensing um, of electromagnetic energy either being emitted or reflected uh, via satellite or aircraft. Um, in archeological circles, that's been extended to include include uh, ground-based sensors that penetrate into the ground. And um, this presentation is all about the various remote sensing efforts that have occurred at Serpent Mound. And uh, almost all of them have not made it out to the general public. So I figured I would try to give that information out so that people can understand what's been going on. Uh, different discoveries that have been made via the use of these non-invasive techniques. So. The very first remote sensing project at Serpent Mound dates back uh, to 1987. Uh, Dr. Paul Wolf and Allison Akers from Wright State University conducted a ground penetrating radar uh, study at Serpent Mound. Because of this uh, diagram right here by uh, Frederick Putnam. When Frederick Putnam from the Peabody Museum at Harvard University excavated in uh, the late 1880s. He published this diagram in a summary of his work uh, in 1890 that includes this cross section of Serpent Mound. And he said that the, the mound itself uh, had stones that were down at the center of it, and then it was covered with yellow clay, and then red clay, and then you had your sod. And what uh, Acres and Wolf tried to do was use the ground penetrating radar to scan over Serpent Mound looking for those stones that were allegedly embedded in the, in, into the base of the serpent. Um, this uh, was a bit challenging for them, um, partly because uh, ground penetrating radar wasn't real advanced at that point. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they used this 300 megahertz sled mountain system where they just sort of dragged it across the ground. Uh, they had what are known as radar grams that were printed on the site. Now today, all that would be digitized. Um, and they had certain station locations that they were looking for. They basically did the area from the tip of the oval through the head of the serpent and back and, uh, you know, uh, uh, down one of the bends of uh, the serpent from there. The uh, findings, um, this is not one of their findings, but I put this up as an example. They said that uh, there were no findings reported from the oval, which is interesting because there should have been remnants of the stone altar there, which we'll see later. Um, but they reported nothing from the oval. But they did say that there were distinctive hyperbola reflections found in the jaws of the serpent, meaning the head of the serpent that curve around the oval. And uh, this is an example here of a hyperbola from ground penetrating radar in the more modern day. Those are created when the radar hits rocks and sometimes voids like animal burrows, um, sometimes tree roots, other things that are in the ground might produce that. Uh, things that have distinctive electrical properties. They said they did find additional hyperbolas 
in the embankment farther down the serpent, meaning once they got to the bend. Um, but because of the seemingly random distribution that they found, Akers concluded that they were likely not the boulders that Putnam suggested were part of the serpent's foundation. Um, they said that there were also distinctive layers detected at the base of the embankment near the middle of the serpent, and that suggested to them to be perhaps the original serpent foundation that was exposed by Putnam during the reconstruction of Serpent Mound in the late 1880s. Um, and so uh, they uh, happened to find that. Now, my guess is that they didn't know a whole lot about the history of Serpent Mound uh, very much, uh, but not, they should have maybe caref more carefully looked at some of Putnam's work. This is a sketch plan uh, that uh, Frederick Putnam did of Serpent Mound before the reconstructions. And one of the things, this is from a much, much bigger map, but one of the things that uh, I've identified on here is that Putnam created this map uh, as a, uh, basically a property map when the park was purchased. And so it had all of the boundary markers uh, surveyed out very accurately on there. And they went around the entire park and identified the names of every tree. This is a hickory tree. Uh, uh, here's a walnut. Uh, this is an ash tree, another ash tree. They identified where every tree was and every large rock that was there. And uh, here's a big rock there. There's a big rock, another rock, another rock, another rock. And so uh, when Akers says they found a uh, rock in the jaws of the serpent, uh, well, Putnam had already identified that there was one there, so that maybe that's the case. They said that they found another one kind of going along the back uh, once you got to the bends. Well, maybe that's the one. Maybe that's the one. Uh, I would think that they confirmed what Putnam had already identified, perhaps. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's kind of interesting. Also, this dotted line here, this is an old fence line because they had cattle out there uh, when Putnam was around. And so um, that fence line uh, we'll see a little bit later during a magnetometer survey that showed up. Uh, I also wanted to point out that uh, when the WPA were here in the 1930s, I found this in the collection of WPA papers. Uh, they also did a survey of Serpent Mound. This is the surveyor's notes. And you'll notice that down in this half down here where the head and the oval is, you see that big dot right there that I've highlighted in green? They actually have a notation there, rock number two, because they were actually surveying out to what they thought were permanent features in the landscape. And they said, well, that big rock right in the mouth of the serpent, that's a permanent feature. That rock is gone today. Well, here's another one. They identified rock number one along the first bend of the serpent. So I'm guessing that maybe Akers and company found those again, uh, even though they'd already been identified a couple of times over. So uh, the first LIDAR survey uh, was done at Serpent Mound in 2007. LIDAR is an acronym that stands for light detection and ranging. Essentially, you fly over with an airplane, you beam a laser, infrared laser, down to the ground. It reflects back some of that information back to a sensor on the plane. That information gives you latitude, longitude, elevation, what it, it reflect off of. Uh, and from that, you collect a whole series of data points and you could create maps from that. Um, usually end up with thousands and thousands of data points and it it's, uh, becomes very, very accurate. You create digital elevation models from that, that material. Well, I had heard that uh, the Ohio uh, uh, Department of Transportation had received a grant from the federal government to pilot a project to collect LIDAR data. They wanted to map all of the state highways in, the, in Ohio. And I said, wow, if they're gonna map state highways, well, State Route 73 goes right in front of Serpent Mound. Maybe they'll get Serpent Mound. So I reached out to them and they said, 
mm, I think they might have. And so they gave me the data sets and I was the first one in Ohio to start using LIDAR for archeology. span So I created the first LIDAR map of, all, of Serpent Mound and we've had all kinds of interesting findings from that map, which I'll show you in a second. But this, how many people here from Ohio? This is your, your tax money at work right here. The uh, Department of Ohio, Ohio Geographically Referenced Information Program, you can go out to their website and you can get this data for the entire state. They now have the entire state covered. You can download that data if you would like to uh, through the Ohio Statewide Imagery Program. And uh, it's uh, you know freely available. You see what the cost is here, the original data program began in 2006, done by the engineering firm of Woolpert Incorporated from Dayton, Ohio. $5.5 million gets you LIDAR for the entire state. All right, and that's what they did. So I, I got the LIDAR data sets um, and I used uh, some software from Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Lab. Uh, they graciously gave me a two-week license and uh, I did all of this work in two weeks uh, to, to sift through all this stuff for, for uh, Serpent Mound. Um, I used uh, the Quick Terrain Modeler to process the data and then the viewer to uh, use that. You can download that Quick Terrain Viewer for free, download those data sets and you can view the LiDAR data yourself if you would like. Um, but back in the day, it, the LiDAR data was not processed. Uh, now, now today it's all processed. You can download the processed data. So I had to do the processing first. Um, and so I created this map in 2007 of Serpent Mound. You can see Serpent Mound right here. This is a color elevation map. The blue being the lowest area. So this is uh, Ohio Brush Creek and then the lower plains down there and then the elevation changes. And so uh, we have the color elevation changes here. Um, so that was the first map that I did. And then I went on to do a whole series of sites across the state of Ohio. I think I did about 60 different mound archeological sites across Ohio. And uh, I went around and, and uh, gave lectures around this across the state. But the first one that I gave was I did this uh, presentation called The Astronomy and Cosmology of Serpent Mound, New Discoveries and Rediscoveries at the Hen Watkins Center for Prehistoric Astronomy, Cosmology, and Cultural Landscape Studies, uh, their annual conference in August of 2007. And so this was my cover slide showing that you create these three-dimensional models and kind of spin around Serpent Mound in every direction to look at that uh, in different detail. But we'll look at the black and white here because it shows up a little bit easier in this light. And I'll point out a few of the quick findings here. So when I talk about Serpent Mound, Let's talk about, we might talk about the spiral tail or the body of the serpent or the neck of the serpent, the head of the serpent or the mounds behind the head of the serpent. There's the head and then the oval. And then uh, there's a little tip mound out there at the end. So we, those are sort of the you know, names of the parts of the serpent there. Um, one of the uh, findings that seemed to be kind of important were these two features on either side of the oval. And I call those newly rediscovered features because uh, back in 1885, there was a guy by the name of Reverend J.P. McLean that came to Serpent Mound with a survey crew and they spent two weeks at Serpent Mound uh, for the Smithsonian mapping out Serpent Mound. And his map, shows those two features at the front of the oval on either side. And uh, for about, uh, let's say, uh, we'll call it 125 years, the archeological community destroyed J.P. McLean. They said that doesn't exist. He made it up. Uh, his interpretation is wrong. That stuff is rubbish. McLean's a moron, you know, you name it. And then I came out with my LIDAR map and now, the archaeologists uh, over at the OHC are now saying, McLean's map is the most accurate map that's ever been done. Well, I could have told them that based on this. Um, you know, 
But nevertheless, there's also, uh, this was kind of an interesting finding. Nobody had ever written about this feature. There's this big giant pit here on the east side of Serpent Mound. That's about 40 feet long, about 25 feet wide, about 12 feet deep. When this popped out on the LIDAR, I was like, oh my gosh, what is that? All the stuff I'd read about Serpent Mound, nobody had ever written about it. And I'm thinking, how's that possible? That's like like 100 feet from Serpent Mound, if that. And uh, yet there it is. So that's, uh, you know, an undiscovered, uh, un kind of a unexplored feature. Nobody's, uh, no archaeologist has taken that on at this point. Um, but you can see, again, uh, Brush Creek down here being really low. This is a creek just to the, to the north of Serpent Mound, uh, given by one of the early uh, archaeologists. They call that North Creek. <laughs> north of Serpent Mound. So this is a little bit wider view, looking at it from a different angle so we can see some of the other features uh, nearby Serpent Mound. We have an Adena Mound, we have a Hopewell Mound, and we have a Fort Ancient Elliptical Mound there. And uh, each one of these mounds, the reason that they're called this in here is because uh, they appear to have burials that had artifacts associated with those burials from those time frames, those cultures. So while the Adena did construct this mound and the burials at the very bottom were from that culture, 80% of the rest of the people buried in that mound were buried later on, uh, at, probably during the intrusive burial mound culture and here in Ohio which was from about 600 AD to about 1000 AD. The Adena were much earlier. They were from about 1000 BC to about 100 BC. Serpent Mound has been carbon dated now, uh, the, the recent carbon dating from the 2011-2012 project. Uh, they carbon dated Serpent Mound to 321 BC. Uh, so it's in that Adena era time frame. This little mound, which is right next to the picnic shelter, that Hopewell Mound right there, I gave it that name because there's only one excavation photo from Harvard of that mound, and they were just uncovering uh, the uppermost burial in which there were two uh, uh, points underneath the armpit, uh, the left armpit of the person being uncovered, and they were both Hopewell points. They were clearly identifiable as Hopewell points, and uh, you can go and see those pictures. I actually wrote a whole paper about that, the uh, artifacts that came out of that mound and its location, because uh, I talked about this yet on Friday night in my talk about the archaeoastronomy of Serpent Mound that seems to sit at the center point of a woodhenge that Putnam had uncovered, although he never wrote about it. Uh, found those records in Harvard's archives. This mound got its name Fort Ancient Mound because the uppermost burial had a Fort Ancient Era point associated with that burial. Although Putnam did say that there were burials underneath that he believed were the oldest burials he'd ever uncovered. Um, but there's really not much to go on. We don't have a lot of evidence uh, other than Putnam's statement, which you know could have been true, could have been false, we don't really know. Um, Nevertheless, uh, there are some other interesting features. So this is one that's a little bit difficult to see in this light. But right here, this is the parking lot here. And there's, uh, I think, the men's restroom here and the women's restroom there. And right here is this really unusual rectangular feature into the ground, uh, which nobody had identified previously, and nobody knows anything about it still to this day. Uh, it's hard to figure out exactly what that rectangle might have been, uh, but that's showed up, and so that's a bit of a mystery. Um, there are also, uh, well, I guess we'll go, we'll go here because it's easier to see maybe, but uh, this is in color. Again, you have those newly rediscovered features on either side of the oval there. But here you can see there are three, uh, there used to be a sign out there uh, by them that called them borrow pits. The earliest uh, archeologists said that those pits were made because that's where they dug up the earth to create Serpent Mound. Notwithstanding the fact that the volume that's there would never be enough to make Serpent Mound. But uh, my friend, archeologist William Romain did a study 
where, with uh, Indiana University and a couple of other uh, universities where they ran um, electrical resistivity lines over those features, uh, which allowed them to kind of see into the ground about 30 feet deep, and they determined that those were actual sinkholes. And um, so uh, those are really sinkholes, not necessarily borrow pits, um, but nevertheless, uh, some interesting findings, yeah. This line right here? Oh, that's the, uh, that's the asphalt pathway. Oh. <laughs> so that's how accurate this is. It's accurate to within three or four centimeters, something like that. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it can even see the relief of that asphalt. So <laughs> it's pretty good. Oh, just to give you an example here of how much data this is, um, I left the data points down here, 244,864 data points to create this map. Now, before this, the most accurate map that had been done of Serpamount was done by my friend Bill Romain. And uh, I asked him one time uh, how many data points it took. He, you know, he was out there with the old tripod and the little lens and some guy in the distance holding the pole. In fact, I held that for him on a couple of occasions. He said that his map that he had created uh, took about uh, between six and 800 data points. <laughs> and so this is... This uh, was a big upgrade, <laughs> big upgrade over that. So uh, back in the probably around 10, 2010, 2011, something like that, uh, the people over at the OHC were starting to work on their UNESCO World Heritage Projects and uh, Serpent Mound was a potential for that. Uh, and one of the things that they had to do or needed to do was to create a management plan for Serpent Mound. They had no management plan for Serpent Mound. So there was a large group of people that were invited to participate. I was involved in those meetings for a number of years. And I put this together and, and handed this out at one of those meetings about the proposed future research directions for Serpent Mound. Um, and so I identified uh, a number of things. Uh, at the time, it was, you know, what are those borrow pits? Well, Remain solved that. Uh, he figured out that those are now sinkholes or caves that were under there. Um, we also have uh, this rectangle, which no one has touched to this day. No one, no one spent any time looking at that. We have um, this area here, which is really interesting. Uh, this is where Putnam found a series of burials that had no mound. Uh, they were just in the ground, uh, right at the, oh, I call the 700 foot elevation contour. And at the time I proposed that, my guess was that there are a lot of burials along that 700 foot contour elevation, probably extending all around the area. Um, why that elevation, I don't really know, but uh, the, it was a, even a question as to how they even discovered that they were there. Um, until I read uh, an account of uh, the excavations at Madisonville, which is outside of Cincinnati, it was a massive, massive burial ground that was discovered in the 1870s. Um, and uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Charles Metz was the one that did, was kind of in charge of a lot of the excavations there. Well, Metz is the one that helped Putnam excavate at Serpent Mound. And in his account of Madisonville, he said that they would line up all the diggers shoulder to shoulder and everybody had a metal rod and they would walk together and they would jam the metal rod into the ground. And if somebody hits something, then they would stop and dig. And that's how they found that burial ground. So I suspect that's exactly what happened here. This is, uh, you know, no magnetometer, no grab and train radar. You jam your metal rod into the ground until you find something. And so uh, I think that's probably how they found it. There's no account that says that they did it that way, but that was gen the general practice of the day, it seems to be. And so uh, they also found a burial down below, which I'll get to, and I think that's how they found the burial down below the cliff. How old were the skeletons at this time? At Madisonville? No, right here. Oh. So that's a good question. Um, there's never been any carbon dating done on that stuff. And so uh, it's unclear an exact date. However, some of the burials had artifacts associated with them and they are a range of 
bear of time frames. So all the different cultures seem to be represented. There was one interesting burial in which there were, I don't know, maybe 14 or 15 different artifacts found with this particular burial. They were all broken and they were all from, they were from every single culture up to Fort Ancient, all associated with this one burial. And, uh, and so it's like, well, how can that be? Well, I talked to a, one of the professors of archaeology at Indiana University about that, uh, and he suggested, well, like we collect artifacts today, maybe the Fort Ancient people were collecting artifacts too, and they buried them all with this guy, uh, you know. But he, had, but there were archaic artifacts, Adena artifacts, Hopewell artifacts, Atchusa burial mound culture artifacts, and Fort Ancient artifacts, all in this one burial. And you're like, what is going on here? Well, maybe that's the case, you know. Maybe there are family heirlooms passed down from generation to generation. Who knows? So was Carbon dating in the sense of that why they would do it? There was no such thing as carbon dating yeah. when Putnam was excavating in the 1880s. Okay. Carbon dating wasn't invented until um, in the 1950s after the atomic bomb, you know, was developed and stuff like that. Okay. So what happened to the remains? What's that? What happened to the remains? So all the remains that were collected from... They could. Okay. All the remains are, had, that, had, that Putnam collected during the excavations by the Harvard Peabody Museum are at the Harvard Peabody Museum today. And um, they, you know, remain in a boxed up in a warehouse, essentially. So, yeah. Is that how you could do DNA yeah, Well, that and you could also do DNA analysis on all those right. people. And uh, that might tell you more than carbon dating would. But uh, in any event, yeah. That's great, great insight, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that that is certainly, uh, you know, something to consider. Yeah. What is that up there in the top right? Is it the footprint of a house? You're talking about this? Yeah. So this was a pond that was constructed. This is, this actually, this line right here is the park boundary, and uh, so this is just off the park boundary. Uh, we think that it was made sometime after the 1940s. Uh, it's hard to date this because of the aerial photographs that I've managed to see. Um, I found an early aerial photograph that does not show the pond around that time frame, and so it probably had to be constructed after that. Uh, but this area up here was where the WPA and the 3C had their field camp when they did all the work at Serpent Mound during the Depression. And so it might be possible that they might have constructed that. They, we know that they constructed at least one pond over there, um, but uh, this might have been another one, a later one. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of historic archaeology from this area that no one's really ever done. Uh, there's a lot of remains of buildings and structures that they built, and then that camp got you know disassembled at some point. Yeah. Sure. It's building on the, the, how you know that the remains are still in some warehouse somewhere? Yeah. What are the chances that that ever gets done, and what, like, what is withholding it? Obviously, okay. it's probably negligence, but it's like, at, what, is, what is their response when prompted? Well, I would say uh, for the first hundred years, it was probably negligence yeah. um, from like 1890 to 1990. But around 1990 was when uh, the NAGPRA law was passed in the United States. That's the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act in which all federal, uh, any, any institution that receives federal money must comply with the NAGPRA Act. Harvard receives federal money for whatever projects, so they have to comply. Every institution had to provide a list of all of the burial remains that, ha that these institutions hold in their collections to the federal government, and they pass those along to the tribes. The tribes then can petition to have, to kind of reclaim, they call that repatriation, reclaim those burial remains of their ancestors and then rebury them or, or do whatever they want with them. Um, but that, I wrote about this in another presentation that I did uh, about a year or so ago. 
The Friends of Serpent Mound has been advocating since about 2006 for the repatriation of the people that were buried at Serpent Mound. Once we learned that there were not any remains in these mounds, we're like, well, where are they? Well, they're at Harvard. Well, why don't we get them back? Because they deserve to be back here, right? All of the people that were buried here, they intentionally were buried there, right? By the people that were living around them, them, you know, their family members, their friends, whatever. So, you know, these things are not property, right? These are people that they're holding in a collection, right? It's like, how gruesome is that, right? Crazy, you know, not so kind of stuff. Well, these museums and institutions have collected thousands and thousands and thousands of sets of human remains. There were 25 at least removed from Serpent Mound, give or take. It's hard to determine how many cremated sets of human remains they actually gathered. But they provided a list of the remains, and so we've been advocating to have those repatriated. Well, the, uh, the private corporation that owns Serpent Mound has their own collection of thousands and thousands and thousands of sets of human remains. And so, you know, the idea that, well, we want to go to Harvard and get some back and bury them in this park over here that we own, they don't want to touch that for a 10-foot pole because that opens them up to doing the same thing. Now, for the last 120-some years that the private corporation of the OHC has owned Serpent Mound, they have been kind of leery of doing anything like that. We've had conversations with them. We've had meetings with them. They always, you know, kind of give us the stiff arm about that, and they don't really want to. They don't really want to deal with it. But since NAGPRA, any of the tribes can petition. All right. Um, yet there isn't any tribe that has stepped forward to petition Harvard to return the burials uh, from Serpent Mound. Okay. So it's, it's a really complicated legal issue, and uh, there's obviously an ethical issue that's there. But in the presentation that I put together, I talked about the barriers for repatriation. Now, um, a friend of mine, uh, Bill Romain, uh, the archaeologist, sent me an article that was written last year by an archaeologist from the Creek Indian tribe. He was commissioned to write an article for the Southeastern Archaeological Conference magazine, quarterly, whatever they put out. And that article was about, it's been 30 years since NAGPRA was passed. What are the results of that? And uh, he had a graphic in there that I included in my presentation. What are the 13 worst offenders for NAGPRA compliance? Harvard was fourth on the list. They have somewhere in the somewhere between 6,500 and 7,000 sets of Native American human remains, hundreds of them, or over a thousand of them, from Ohio. Okay, so Serpent Mound is a tiny fraction of the amount that they have of their even just the remains from Ohio. The OHC was third on the list. They have even more sets of human remains in their collection, and so uh, you know. The two biggest barriers are two of the top worst offenders for complying with NAGPRA over the past 30 years. And so, you know, it's, to me, this is how I posed it. I posed it to some of the tribes I talked to. I said, um, would you allow Walmart to hold on to your ancestral relatives? Would you allow uh, McDonald's, Amazon? If the answer is no, then why do you allow that private corporation over there to do it, right? It doesn't make any sense. These people aren't thinking this through. Like, it's incomprehensible to me that we allow private corporations to house human remains. It's, it's crazy, right? And so, you know, to me, that, that message hasn't really gotten out. But that is kind of the state of you know, prehistoric archaeology in the United States. Probably 90% of all the sets of human remains are held by private corporations. And, you know, because there are all these cultural, they call them cultural resource management, private archaeological firms. And they hold thousands and thousands of sets of human remains. And, uh, you know, 
not just academic institutions, right? But if, at least if they're held by the government, there's some representation and some oversight that you could petition somebody to. The corporations, there's no oversight. No idea what, what's being done with any of it. We have no idea who's in charge of it. We don't know how they're being treated. We know that in many cases, they destroyed stuff. They've lost stuff. They haven't kept track of it. The NAGPRA records show that. One of the things I, sh I found through my ca looking at the records at Harvard was I had identified the sets of human remains that were here at Serpent Mound and which mound that they came from, right? Well, when I went back to do this recent presentation for repatriation, I went back and double checked the list and they have since lost one. So just in the couple of years since, since uh, you know, they, they started, you know, putting those records out, the, the records change and stuff, stuff vanishes. So it's really a, a sad situation. And, you know, we're going to continue to advocate for the repatriation until it happens. You know, and I don't care who wants to get involved. I don't care how many tribes get involved. I, it just needs to be done because it's the right thing to do, right? right? Yeah, it's not appropriate for these corporations and institutions with no oversight to hold on to all those people because they're people. They're not property. They're people, right? right? Yeah. And that's the, that's, the, that's the real rub, you know? So in any event, um, getting back to this map, there, this is where that Adena mound is, and there's this big area right here that I found a map at Harvard in which Putnam had identified this area that he had said that there were a lot of potholes. Somebody had been digging in there. And uh, so we don't really know much about that area. He called it a habitation area or a village site, but it doesn't appear, I mean, when you say village site, that, that is a very specific archaeological thing. Um, and we don't see the evidence, based on Putnam's diggings there, of an actual village. What we do see was he, he found pits that had burn material in them, um, in which he said, well, these are the hearths from all the buildings. But that may not be the case. Uh, it could be that they, that's where they were cremating people. Could be that's where they were fire treating chert to make tools. Could be a whole range of things. Could be, we know that, there, that a lot of people were buried up here. It could be areas where they were processing the dead. For, there could be a whole range of things, not necessarily a village. And so uh, I just, you know, I kind of couched that area. But that area really needs more exploration. The problem is, is that this whole area is sort of triangulated by this mound and this mound and kind of where the museum sits has been so used over time. I, I came across a um, aerial photograph taken by a guy by the name of Dash Rees from the 1930s. He took the earliest aerial photographs of Serpent Mound. And there were uh, something on the order of like 22 buildings in that area because it was a working farm. And, uh, you know, so they had buildings for all kinds of stuff. And uh, the, all those buildings are gone today. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, that area remains uh, kind of a mystery. So it's hard to know if there's some village between I mean, looks, is, this is a spiritual center, a ceremonial area, and the people bring their dead here. And they bring that's, them that's correct, yeah. <laughs> right. Which tribe it came from, and what should the DNA test be for? That... That, well, yes, uh, from a scientific standpoint, that would be the way, that would be the way to do it. That's the real proof. Yes, but, but many of the tribes uh, don't allow that. I don't allow that. Yeah. It's just a little bitty. I understand, but they believe that you take any part away from those people and it disturbs their soul, right? So, so it's, uh, it's a bit of a tricky um, situation. That may be changing with some of the tribes. Um, there are some of the tribes that say, well, you know, teeth naturally fall out of people. You could do DNA on teeth. Um, and so some tribes allow that. Uh, other tribes say, no, you can't touch any bit, you know. So hopefully uh, th th they will realize the value of being able to establish their heritage from it. But well, we 
think so, but but again, how, um, well, I'll give you one example of why uh, possibly the native tribes might be leery about doing DNA. So there was a, a DNA study done of one of the tribes, I think in Colorado, in which they, they did DNA on almost every tribal member that was there. And the university that did the study, I can't remember which university it was, but they uh, had an agreement with the tribe about data confidentiality or whatever. And so they, they were just to try to understand, you know, looking at prehistoric burials versus the modern tribe, where they were later or not or whatever. Well, a few layers down the road, it turns out that a pharmaceutical company bought the DNA data from the university and then began studying it for their own purposes <clears throat> through a medical study. And so the tribe didn't know, the tribe didn't authorize it. And so, you know, they're, pre they're pretty sensitive about, you know, getting, getting uh, you know, uh, run roughshod again, uh, you know, based on corporations, you know, coming in, just try to, you know, uh, rape and pillage them all over again, right, essentially. And so, uh, you know, they, they're pretty hesitant about that. Why should they allow Harvard to do DNA studies on this if they're just going to turn around and give it to somebody else? You know, that's their thinking. So you have to, you have to think these things through. Also, DNA studies have, have gotten better over time. When DNA analysis was done 25 years ago, it was pretty rudimentary. It's gotten better now. Uh, a couple of institutions look like they're responsible. Harvard is one. Stanford is the other one in the United States that do what appear to be fairly responsible, ethical you know, DNA studies of native peoples throughout North and South America. But a lot of tribes are like, nah, you're not touching us. You know, we're sovereign to you. We're not going to let you have that stuff, right? So, and I can see, you know, some of the reasons I. All right. So we also, um, we're going to talk about this additional coil here, which is invisible in this LIDAR, but which was found through a magnetometer survey. Uh, and then a possible post hole at the front of the serpent. And then one of the things that I keep advocating for is if you really want to know what has happened at Serpent Mound, this giant debris erosion pile at the base of the cliff uh, could serve as a bit of a time capsule. All you have to do is trench down through the whole thing and you can get the entire record of, you know, how, you know what kind of flooding had happened down there, you know, what kind of, all kinds of data. <laughs> Because of that debris pile is, is, you know, erosion here is a constant thing. It never stops, right? Uh, it's incessant. And so, uh, you know, we have all that erosion debris at the bottom. Why not dig into it and see what's there, maybe? And a possible altar. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, this convergence point, which I talked about in my talk on Friday, that's the place where all of the astronomical alignments for the sunrises and moonrises happen. But it's off the edge of the cliff. Well, was there something there or not? Well, we don't know because nobody's done any studies of that. And then what happened to the double oval and the linear features around the oval and the head of the serpent? The, that uh, is a bit of a puzzle still yet to be solved. All right, so I talked about those astronomical alignments. I'll show them quickly here. This is uh, Bill Romaine's north-south line that he uh, discovered. And then all the rest of these are all of the astronomical alignments. Of course, our festival is based around the summer solstice sunset alignment through the head and the oval and the summer solstice sunrise alignment that's incorporated into the design of Serpent Mound. And then, of course, there's all these lunar alignments, planetary alignments, which I talked about for a couple hours on Friday. If you were to stand... Uh, in on the other side of Brush Creek, which is down at the bottom there, and you looked in profile towards Serpent Mound, that purple circle is the convergence point. But from there is the place where you can see all of the moonrise and sunrise alignments during the key times of the cycles of the sun and the moon. <laughs> that would be funny. So uh, over the past several years, I have been working on a project to photograph all of those astronomical alignments of the sun. And so I've got a series of drone shots here that'll kind of illustrate that. So here's our Venus, vernal equinox sunrise. Um, 
I'm going to try this again. I don't know if this is in. Yeah, this is one's in here. So uh, this is a time lapse film that I took in 2015. This is the vernal equinox coil, and you're going to see the sun come up there after these people walk out of the way. And uh, there's your alignment right in the center of the bend of the serpent. Now, uh, recently, uh, Brad Lepper, the OHC, and uh, Chief Ben Barnes of one of the, Sh of the Shawnee tribe of Oklahoma uh, said that there are no astronomical alignments at Serpent Mound. They don't exist. He says sight lines are too short. Can we call bullshit on that? <laughs> there it is. You can just watch it. What should I say? You can, bl you can believe your lying eyes? <laughs> or... or or you can, it's the Jedi mind trick. There are no alignments here. Okay. So uh, there's your vernal equinox sunset, right through that bend there, opposite bend. Here's your summer solstice sunrise. It's a little tricky to see because there was fog. I, usually there's fog here at summer solstice. This is the one weekend where we haven't had any uh, for a while. Uh, but nevertheless, there you, there you go. Here's a a view from the ground. Uh, we've advocated for the removal of trees in, the, in these areas where you can watch the alignments. Uh, there's the sun coming up through the alignment. You'll see it pop up above the tree there. This is the bend behind the head. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's uh, your summer solstice sunset, uh, which We'll probably get my drone up there and we will project it on the screen. You can watch it live tonight. Uh, we did that last night and it worked out pretty well. There's your alignment. Here's your autumnal equinox sunrise, which is the same as the vernal equinox sunrise, except with more leaves on the trees. And then you have your sunset again with more leaves on the trees. Uh, I once asked uh, one of the guys who did the uh, sunrise alignments, uh, the, he, it was uh, Terry Cameron and Robert Fletcher, and I asked Terry Cameron about his uh, you know, work, because he had done it in the 80s, long before I was you know, around on the scene. And he said, I asked him, I said, well, why'd you only do the sunrise alignments? And he said that um, because there were too many leaves on the trees to the west, we couldn't, we couldn't observe that. And I said, well, shoot, you know, why didn't you just do it in the springtime when there are no leaves on the trees? And he's like, yeah, we never did that. So we, we ended up doing that in the 2000s and identifying them all. There's your winter solstice sunrise. It's usually kind of poor weather, but managed to get a shot there a little bit. And there's your winter solstice sunset. This is the most recent one that was discovered. I discovered this back in 2015. Um, I had a hypothesis that if you stood here at this last bend and you looked right through the center of the spiral, that would be the location where the sun would set on the winter solstice. And then I captured it, lo and behold. In fact, here is the photo that I took that uh, confirmed that. And uh, then Bill Romaine also confirmed it using uh, trigonometry uh, to confirm that uh, as well. So we put that out there. And uh, so that's, that's the most recent alignment. So both sunsets on the solstice were once once or are really important? That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that was by accident. Yep, and also here's a, here's a time lapse of that. Uh, I took that in 2017. So you can see that uh, sun coming down. Here's your center of the spiral right in here. That's an interior camera reflection from the sun. So, by the way, that that ridge that it's setting behind is the rim of the meteor crater. So it sets up right behind the rim there. All right. So in 2011, uh, as part of Bill Romaine's Serpent Mound project, I mentioned that he had done an electric resistivity uh, survey uh, across the the body of the serpent, and then they did those sinkholes. And so uh, this is a picture of uh, Romaine standing there and a couple of students from IU that were working with Dr. William Monahan, because uh, Monahan was an expert in this. And uh, so they did a kind of a survey of that. 
and uh, this was Romain's uh, paper that he did with a guy by the name of Michael Zaela from Wittenberg University. He was uh, from the Department of Geology. Romain uh, gave me permission to show this, uh, but he's showing some of the uh, profiles here from the ERGI electric resistivity uh, tools that they were working on. And uh, you can kind of see he's talking about the karst region that's surrounding Serpent Mound and uh, identifying you know, here where those sinkholes were and looking at what they look like down into the ground. Um, now, you might think that, well, if these are sinkholes and they're right here near Serpent Mound, maybe it might be important archeologically. That would be my first uh, thought. Uh, but one of these sinkholes actually opened up in the 1990s and uh, the uh, OHC management at the time uh, decided to pour 14 dump truck loads worth of gravel down into it instead of dropping a camera down into it to see what was down there. Uh, and so that's a, that, that may be just one of the few uh, dozen archeological crimes that they've committed over the years. Um, because uh, this area here, right around these sinkholes between where the parking lot is and where the sinkholes are, there was an archeological dig that was done by the OHC they put a water line in for a drinking fountain in 1990 and 89. I think it was a two year project. And they ran that water pipe along that area uh, and they ran it between that little Hopewell mound and the picnic shelter. And it ran to where the original main pathway was from the parking lot to Serpent Mound and that's where they put the drinking fountain. Well, when they did that, they did block excavation along the entire length of that, at least probably 90% of it until they got to the last 20 or 30 feet and they banded it. But along that uh, run, right when it passed by this area here where the sinkholes were, that was where they found the highest concentration of artifacts. Oh. And, uh, and uh, you won't be surprised to learn that the OHC never wrote a report about any of the findings. Um, there was a volunteer that was on the project. He was a historian here in Adams County and he had his own sort of history magazine that he published. And as he worked on the dig, he interviewed the archeologist that did the dig. And he said that that was so important because what they were finding was a massive amount of artifacts from the intrusive burial mound culture. And outside of finding intrusive burial mound people in other burial mounds that, that that's what they're named for, there hasn't really been intrusive burial mound culture sites like where people lived or where they did stuff. And so it was his opinion that this would be one of the most important findings uh, from this dig was to find that. Well, not only did they never write a report, they fired that archeologist and he left the archeological business and hasn't been heard from since. So, uh, you know, that stuff that was collected, you wanna take a guess how many artifacts were reportedly found? 30,000. How many? 30,000. That's a good guess, somewhere between 10 and 12,000. 10 to 12,000. Oh my God. Yeah. And uh, no report. Now, about a decade after this dig occurred, a student at Ohio State University, an undergraduate student, was doing a uh, service project for one of her classes at OSU, and they assigned her to go work over with the OHC. And they assigned her to go through all these boxes and bags full of stuff that they had dug up at Serpent Mound. And so she spent an entire half year trying to sort through it all and try to organize it in something. And she ended up writing uh, over a hundred and page report from her findings, which I found uh, in the archives at the OSU um, with photographs of some of the artifacts tables of how many were found, where they were found, what the block excavation looked like. 
but uh, she said that that it all her efforts she never got to the point where they could even accession the material into the collections. So, at, you know, even a decade after this dig took place, none of that material had ever been cataloged and entered into the OHC's collection. Um, and so uh, here we stand to this day with probably the largest excavation that had been done at Serpent Mound since Putnam, no report, no, nothing released to the public. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. The tribes could re request it, uh, repatriate it. What's that? Would they honor the request? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, that's a more complicated answer, probably. Um, but I would say that the tribes would have to know about it first. Because, again, there's no report. It's not been accessioned into the collection. So what are they asking for, right? Like, there's no documentation. Uh, so that's, it's a problem. It's a real problem. It's, you know. What's that? So they would have to go to OHC and ask. Oh, at the time, uh, I, I don't think that anybody was doing it at the time. No, uh, that would, are you talking about the, the lead curator? The lead curator at the time was probably Martha Otto. Yeah, yeah, Brad, Brad Lepper was uh, kind of underneath Martha at, at that point. Just to show you a picture, this is uh, Romaine's picture of those sinkholes, and this is the area for between here and the parking lot that we're talking about. This is a photo that I dug up from the Adams County Historical Society archives that, that uh, showed the snow fence that they put up around the sinkhole opening originally, and then they brought in the gravel and dumped it down in there. Um, Romaine and I have talked about this on, on a number of occasions that we wondered if maybe those sinkholes served a similar purpose that the Mayans used the senouts for down in uh, down in the Yucatan. Uh, you know, they would sacrifice things down into the those senouts where you know the water is uh, into the underground because that's essentially what these were uh, these openings to the underworld that had water down in them, perhaps. Uh, and yet, you know, we're just going to dump up truckloads worth of gravel down there instead. That wouldn't have happened in Mexico, that's for sure. Right, right. So this is another uh, view from that electric resistivity ground imaging of one of those uh, sinkholes showing the giant void down there. Um, there is one that didn't get the gravel in it. And so there is one with a huge underground cavity down, down, uh, down below maybe about between 17 and 30 feet wide, at least. All right. So during that same Serpent Mound project that Romain led, he had gotten a whole series of archaeological experts to help him out. One of those is Dr. Jared Burks from Ohio Valley Archaeology Incorporated. And there's a picture of him during that project using his GeoScan Research FM256 Fluxgate Gradiometer Magnetometer, uh, which he walked along and sent a pulse into the ground, and then the data received from that, he then was able to map. And uh, this was his results, which was published in one of the scientific papers uh, called New Radiocarbon Dates Suggest Serpent Mound is More Than 2,000 Years Old. This is from the Ancient Earthworks Project. Um, and this is his magnetometer data here. And you'll see that he discovered what appears to be what he calls an abandoned coil, another bend in the serpent, essentially. Uh, this is a fence line that I mentioned earlier that shows up nicely in his magnetometer. And uh, so that is exciting find uh, and uh, something that nobody had anticipated being there. Uh, they did verify this via excavation. Uh, they got uh, permanent extension to do a dig essentially right across this portion right here and uh, you could see in once they were recovered got through the topsoil layer there was this uh, lighter colored layer of soil where this appeared to have been the remnant of they did not find anything to carbon date that however they did find uh, I don't know something on the order of 30 odd flint chips uh, at the time, uh, 
Jared Burke's, uh, is, Jared Burke's opinion of it was they were probably from the archaic, but uh, that would be an interesting finding nonetheless. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the, as a result of the third part of the project, which is not remote sensing related, but Indiana University did a series of core samples uh, through the body of the serpent, the whole sort of length of it, uh, they did uh, something like uh, 17 uh, cores, and they looked at the. They were able to create a soil profile of the serpents uh, all along its entire length, so they could see what was Putnam's reconstruction backfill versus where was the original core of the mound, where was the base of the mound, and and down into the bedrock. They went all the way from the top down to the bedrock, and what they found was that at the very base layer where the man was constructed upon, seven of the cores had carbon datable material, which they sent off. The Friends of Serpent Mound uh, sponsored half of the cost of that. Uh, we paid for half of the carbon dating. Uh, Romaine was able to get a couple of grants from some other people to cover the rest of it. And uh, the median age that came back from that was 321 BCE, or during the Adena era. So, uh, you know, when you go over to Serpent Mound today and you read the historical marker, it tells you that it's built by the Fort Ancient people. That would be over a thousand years after this date. Uh, so those things are now obsolete. Mm -hmm. Is there an astronomical alignment for that? Like so a lot of people have asked me that. Um, obviously, the sun and the moon don't get any farther than this. Right. So the question would be, well, what could it possibly be all the way up here? My suspicion um, is that they were pointing towards one of the circumpolar constellations to the north. Uh, if you know your astronomy, what are those circumpolar constellations? You saw my talk on Friday. Uh, Draco comes up there, right? Uh, that's one. Uh, could be the Big Dipper or, you know, half a, half a dozen other ones, right? Uh, but that would be something that would be pointing in that direction. All right. So in 2019, after I have got my uh, drone, I got a uh, DJI uh, Pro 2, I started to work on drone photography. You saw some of them. I started working on identifying all of the astronomical alignments for the sun. Uh, but I also did a mapping project at Serpent Mound. I just uh, I bought a license of some software that allows the drone to map the entirety of it and then stitch all of those photos together. So I did uh, 805 high resolution photographs of different parts of the area. It stitched them all together. That took 17 days processed on my computer to do that. And uh, this is the results of this project. I'll show you that in a second. But one of the things that showed up, which was really interesting, was this big circle right here in this bend of the serpent, which is the summer solstice sunset bend, which is the same alignment as what appears uh, here. And um, now nobody really knows exactly what that is. But when I started looking more carefully into this, I kind of found a bit of more of a mystery. So. This is the highest resolution ortho map uh, that's ever been done of Serpent Mound. I did that um, with those images and it allowed the software to stitch together this giant mosaic map, super high resolution stuff. And uh, it found, we were able to find a couple of features archeologically that, that nobody knew of before, which is <clears throat> these three circles. So there's one here and then one here, and then one here. And uh, we don't really know what those features are. Uh, they were not visible in Jared Burks' magnetometer survey. So that means that they are not made up of magnetically uh, sensitive soil or magnetically induced soil that would show up in the magnetometer. There's something else. Uh, what that something else might be, that's hard to say, right? Uh, but one of the things that, that you can do is you can separate out the wavelengths of light on the, the, the drone sensor. And so I put together a spectral image of that. 
and uh, you can see that they're cooler here, here, and here than uh, some of the surrounding area. They show up there in that blue. I also did a thermal image, and again, uh, there's your circle, there's your circle, there's your circle there. So uh, it shows up in a number of different wavelengths. There's blue, here's red, right? So whatever it is, it's there. Uh, and again, it's another one of these uh, archaeological mysteries, what that could be. Just to give you an idea how big this is, it's about between 90 and 100 feet in diameter. So that's bigger than the width of this tent or the length of this tent, <laughs> right? So it's a, not a small feature. Uh, they're pretty big, uh, but what they are, uh, any, nobody knows. One of the things you can do with that aerial mapping data is you can do something called photogrammetry into 3D, which I did. Uh, now, in these areas where there's lots of trees, it kind of loses its integrity, but you can create a three-dimensional model and, of Serpent Mound, which I did, and you can spin around. It's just like the LIDAR data, essentially, but in visible light. And so uh, we kind of created uh, that so you can kind of see this. And uh, here's another view looking at it from a different angle. I will say, uh, if we go to this next one, uh, there's your circle. It shows up pretty easily there. Now, interestingly enough, I see it uh, most readily in the spring. Um, I would say March and April is probably when I see it the easiest with the aerial photography. Um, but it, it, is, it reappears year after year after year. I even went back and looked at the earliest aerial photographs that were taken by Dash Rees in the 1930s, and it's in his aerial photograph, um, which shocked me. I was like, wow, it's really there. It's really there. All right. Yeah, it looks like it's raised too, like it has some depth yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. So there's another shot. Now, one of the interesting things from this data, uh, you can get what's called a digital elevation model. That's what's underlying this. And uh, it's, it's a bit like LIDAR. It looks at the elevation based on something called shape from shading. Uh, it's, a, it's a process that was developed at Jet Propulsion Laboratory back in the uh, late 1980s by a guy by the name of Dr. Mark Carlotto. He was looking at uh, different kinds of satellite photography, and then he started looking at images from the Viking mission on Mars and creating three-dimensional models of landforms based on shape from shading. And so that's essentially what this process is, is doing shape from shading. And uh, it's hard to see in this light, but there's a feature right in the center of the oval. And I'll blow this up so hopefully you can see that here. But there is this little circle right here is the remnant of this stone altar that used to be in the center of the oval at Serpent Mound. Now, that is a photo that was post-reconstruction. Um, there is no photos of the oval before Putnam did his reconstruction. He did take some pictures of Serpent Mound beforehand, but none of the oval or the head, at least none that have turned up. So. Uh, this was reported by Squire and Davis in their uh, illustration in, in the very first publication that mentioned Serpent Mound. They talked about it, and uh, so we know that that feature existed. This picture I colorized from the original black and white glass plate slide from Harvard. Um, I used a uh, digital coloration process that, uh, that was invented about three years ago, four years ago. And um, so that, we know that that feature existed. Uh, for those that are wondering why it's not there today, um, that feature lasted in the Oval until the 1980s. And then in the 1980s, the uh, OHC park management got tired of cutting the grass around it. And so they picked up the stones and walked them to either side of the cliff and threw them over the cliff. Historic preservation at its finest. Yeah, yeah. Right. What's that? Yeah, yeah. So I actually worked with the, uh, a, 
one park manager who was a bit open-minded about it, um, when we heard the story about that from a former park manager who kind of helped participate in it, um, I thought to myself, well, if they're that lazy in cutting the grass around it, they're probably gonna be pretty lazy in disassembling it. And so I suspected that they took the shortest distance from there to the, the edge of the cliff to throw them over. And so we did a uh, project whereby uh, the park manager got kind of an industrial leaf blower. And in the fall, we blew down all of the leaves and the vegetation down both sides of the oval. And in about a 10 to 12 foot wide area going down there, we found a bunch of the stones. Um, so we flagged them out, notified the OHC, and uh, there has nothing that has been done about it. Um, now we talked about it in the management plan meetings. The quandary for the OHC about this is if they were to restore it by gathering up all the original stones and putting them back, they're afraid that people will walk away with them as souvenirs. Mm. And they're really archaeological artifacts, essentially. So you take pictures and duplicate it and set the duplication and put the other in a museum. So that, that, that was discussed. That was the other alternative, um, was to recreate the stone altar with new material. Nobody wanted to do that. So uh, the, they're they're at the status quo of not doing anything, right? You don't want to put them in a museum then? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. You should make an entire presentation on all the crimes that they've committed. <laughs> so, since I did that original LIDAR project in 2007, LIDAR technology has advanced a wee bit. Uh, and now, you have ha uh, if you have an iPhone, like I've got an iPhone right here, iPhone 12 has built-in LiDAR, okay? And so I did a project where I took a selfie stick and I walked around the outside of the oval and I did a LiDAR map of the oval of Serpent Mound with my iPhone. And uh, that's in visible light. If you recall what I said about my original LiDAR data map, it was about 225,000 data points. This, you can see here at the top, 6.5 million data points for just the oval. So the technology has dramatically gotten better, and now you can just walk around with it in your phone. Oh All right. God. Now, if I remove the visible light and I look at the underlying structure there, there's your altar. There's your stone altar right there. So this is what I'm talking about in terms of doing archaeology. I'm not an archaeologist, okay? I have no professional training in archaeology. This represents the democratization of archaeology. Every one of you in the audience can do archaeology now with just your phone, okay? So this is important to document and find. This is not the kind of stuff that the academics are really doing, right? When I first heard about this kind of work, what in kind of inspired me was I heard about this project at Stanford University. There was a group of archaeological students out on an archaeological dig that were, you know, the, the students are trained that they have to do drawings of every layer that they uncover. <laughs> So they have all this paperwork and drawings that they have to do. Well, one of the guys was like, what do we need that for? I'll just go get my Xbox and we'll hook up the, the, the Connect part of it and we'll write some software and we'll just use our Xbox Connect, which has LiDAR, and we'll just scan the dig and scan the dig and scan the dig every time you can scan the dig. And you don't need to do all of that nonsense. You can take your photos, you can create super digital, you know, records of exactly what's there in, in, you know, all the colors of the rainbow. You don't need to do all that nonsense. You just need to do this, right? So I encourage people to, you know, maybe think about what can they contribute uh, to this. To give you another example, I went down to the cave below the cliff at Serpent Mound and I just, 
did the same thing. Got my selfie stick, waved my phone around, and I created a three-dimensional model of the cave, which had never been done. Uh, out west, a number of the tribes have uh, certain practices with pregnant women in which they take them out to give birth in caves that have these sort of cleft features in them. And I had this hypothesis that maybe what we're looking at here is a birthing cave, right? A lot of people have this idea that Serpent Mound was a woman's site, and uh, that might be part of that. That might be some evidence that goes towards that, right? So they would call this the portal to the underworld or the emergence of where new souls come from. That's why they would do birthing in these places. All right. So there are many new technologies and applications today that are assisting in these non-invasive archaeological techniques. Every day, new methods are being developed, right? I did those mapping projects with a consumer drone. You can go and buy that drone and you can do those projects. I bought my iPhone and did that LiDAR scanning. You can do those projects, right? So all of these technologies and applications and methods are finding their way into the hands of non-professionals like me, and we're the ones that are making these new discoveries. So what will you find? What will you discover? Will you be next? Thank you very much.